Let's talk about the burden proof, because honestly, it wasn't the focus of the steel man I created on Atheist. Some individuals seem to think that that was the main goal or purpose of my video. And I'll admit, I've been a bit confused about why that is. But let me break it down because it's a straightforward concept. So this is part four of my response to critiques of my older video tile, Steel Man on Atheist. Usually I walk through exactly what was said, but this time I think it's important to give you some extra context by revisiting the full steel man I presented. Here's what I stated. For the Atheist, is this an accurate steel man? An atheist cannot have faith in atheism. One cannot accept atheism like a man accepts an apple or a jacket. It just is. A theist can accept the idea of deities, but an atheist cannot accept it as atheism is just a lack of belief in deities. Atheism is the default position. Theism introduces the claim that there are deities and must provide evidence to the atheist since the theist has the burden of proof. When one claims an atheist has faith, it's illogical as you cannot accept the lack of belief in something. The steel man wants to show I understand what an atheist is saying here. My version of a steel man on the atheist position. It's very simple, right? There was hardly any major critique on this steel man itself, but a majority of the responses came after my arguments against it. Sort of a bit of backstory, I kept hearing some comments on my video from people saying I don't understand what atheism is. So I created this steel man to demonstrate that I do understand what certain individuals are saying about atheism. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I can repeat it back accurately. And again, I don't agree with it. But this critique from a certain creator seems to be the backbone of his response to my entire video. John stated this in response to my steel man. Good, and I agree here. I've added some things around, but I haven't really changed anything. And I'll stick to his steel man of an atheist, that's fine. But now, let's just have a look at the burden of proof. We understand his position of what an atheist is. The question is about who has the burden of proof, an atheist or the theist. So let's find out what we're trying to figure out here. The burden of proof is the obligation to prove one's assertion. Just in case, an assertion, a confident and forceful statement of fact or belief. Who has the burden of proof in an argument? The burden of proof is always on the person making an assertion or proposition. Shifting the burden of proof, a special case of argumentum ad interantium, is the fallacy of putting the burden of proof on the person who denies or questions the assertions being made. So because we're both debating that the other person has the burden of proof here, I thought I'd add in the fallacy. So either I am doing the fallacy of putting the burden of proof on you, and I actually have the burden of proof, or you're doing the fallacy of putting the burden of proof on me when actually you do. And just before I let him continue, after I watched this video originally, I did actually go into the comments and tell him he's wrong. <laughs> Respectfully, of course. And we did have a good conversation about it. We will quickly go over that at the end of the video, because we start to see where the confusion is. But now let me address the truth about atheism and the burden of proof, or how I defined it. The simple answer is that atheists, just like theists, can carry the burden of proof depending on the claims they make. If an atheist claims God does not exist, or even I lack the belief in a God, they are still making a claim about their stance on God's existence or their belief states on it, and that claim requires justification. So both atheists and theists bear the burden of proof, depending on the context of the conversation and the claims they make. Now, now some individuals seem to misunderstand the burden of proof, thinking it only applies to positive claims such as God exists, and that it requires definite proof that the claim is true in reality. But that's not how the burden of proof is generally understood in philosophy. Now in academic discussions, the burden of proof applies to any claim, whether positive or negative. It's not about proving something beyond all shadow of a doubt, but about providing reasonable justification for your position. Now take for the legal context for example. Some argue that atheists don't have a burden of proof, but this comparison overlooks key differences. In court, a prosecutor might prove someone's guilty, but that doesn't necessarily mean that person is actually guilty in reality. It just means the evidence was convinced enough to convince the judge or jury. Likewise, in philosophical debates, the burden of proof is about offering sufficient justification justification for a claim, not about proving about absolute certainty. Now respectfully, I believe this critique highlights one of his biggest errors this creator had made when analyzing my video. Now determining who bears the burden of proof wasn't the focus of the video. As I explained beforehand, the point was that atheism can be chosen as a position, a position that requires some degree of confidence, which I define that confidence as faith. Even though I appreciate he put way more effort into his critique compared to the others, which it seems like he did, it doesn't change the fact that his analysis rests on a flawed premise. And this flaw impacts the rest of his arguments throughout the rest of the video. So recently I've been trying to focus more on explaining what the burden of proof actually is and how it's used in discussions and debates and how once you make a claim you may be required to bear that burden. Now when I made the original video that wasn't a central focus but I had a stance on the burden of proof but it really hasn't changed too much at all. It boils down to these two points. Firstly 
the burden of proof may be required to rationally hold your position in a discussion. And secondly, every claim, whether positive or negative, can be subject to the burden of proof. And as a side note, if you claim you lack the belief in a God, that is still a claim. A claim that you lack the belief in a God. Now in my experience, some people argue that it's not a claim because they don't like framing it that way. But it, it technically still is. Then again, that's a whole different discussion if you want to go into that. Now I'm not going to argue too much against the definition John gave for the burden of proof. The burden of proof is the obligation to prove one's assertion. The main issue I see here is what he thinks it means to prove an assertion versus what I think it means. Now, I explained in previous videos that in philosophy, the burden of proof involves reasoning and providing some type of epistemic justification for your claims. That's what it means to prove an assertion. Now, even according to the Oxford English Dictionary, to prove is to define as to establish as true, to make certain, to demonstrate the truth by evidence or argument. It's not about proving something beyond all doubt. When it comes to proof, the OED defines it as something that proves a statement. Evidence or argument establishing a fact or the truth of anything or belief in the certainty of something an instance of this and the action process or fact of proving or establishing the truth or validity of a statement the action of evidence in convincing the mind these definitions show that proof involves providing reasoning or evidence that convinces the mind of the truth or validity of a claim. It's not about achieving some irrefutable certainty, but includes offering sufficient justification for one's position. Now when discussing the burden of proof, is this reasoning the epistemic justification that's required. Now for example, if I claim that Bigfoot exists and provide a cartoon as evidence, I technically provided some form of proof, but most people would probably argue that it's weak or insufficient. But the key here is that this distinction is that while the cartoon is technically evidence, I could say I presented this as proof because the cartoon is something that can be used to prove my statement. Now I'm willing to bet that a majority of people would reject it because they personally don't find the evidence strong, relevant, or reliable. Now colloquially, many people would say that's not proof because they believe that proof should contain strong, reliable evidence. But what that really means is that they personally wouldn't consider that proof because they don't find the evidence convincing. There's a difference between proof in a general sense, which means any form of evidence used to support a claim and what individuals personally consider as sufficient proof. Now, this distinction matters because people have different standards of proof. So technically, while some say there is a standard of proof, not everyone agrees on what that standard is. Now, regarding the shifting the burden of proof fallacy, I agree with John's definition up to a point, but I think there's a misunderstanding around the term deny. But based on his logic that he provided here, it seems to suggest that if I deny the claim that the moon exists, I don't have a burden of proof. But even in the case of God, I do find this reasoning flawed. Now, I personally say if someone claims God does not exist and I deny that, I would still bear a burden of proof. Because if I deny something, using how he defines deny, not saying he's right or wrong, it's still an assertion. John seems to believe that if I state God exists, and he responds with God doesn't exist, or I lack the belief in God, and I ask for his reasons or his epistemic justification, that constitutes the shifting the burden of proof fallacy. But that's not true. The fallacy really occurs if I make someone have a burden of proof based on a claim they never stated. And also if I state that if you can't disprove my claim, then my claim is true, that would be a little more of an argument from ignorance. Now, those two kind of often overlap, but shifting really occurs when someone asks another to disprove a claim they didn't make. Now, later in his critiques, John did brought up an analogy that the burden of proof applies to existence and not non-existence, but there are flaws in this logic, and that part of the critique I'll address a little more in detail in the later videos. It's essential to differentiate between the burden of proof naturally shifting in a conversation and the fallacy of the shifting the burden of proof. So here's my question to you. Do you think I actively shifted the burden of proof in my videos? Because honestly, I have no issue hearing your responses as long as you're not straw manning me, at homes, or just troll in the comments. All right, that's all I got for now. Uh, hit the like or dislike or just click here for the next video, and if there is now, check out the previous one if you missed them, but that's all I got. Cool. Here, take care.